Yeah, I mean, for a long time, like my only ambitions were, you know, just going to the Olympics and racing cross, like XCO, cross country Olympic. And then, you know, I missed the Olympic team in 2021 and just kind of pivoted and was like, oh, I'll try something different. Go. I, always wanted, I always had wanted to race Leadville, but it was always just hard to, to do with World Cups and whatever else, kind of trying to find the time. Um, you know, so went and did that, had success there and uh, then just kind of started doing other things that I wanted to do. And I feel like the last, you know, couple of years I've made a career of just doing what I want to do, which is, you know, these long, like the lifetime series was like, Oh, this is kind of cool. I've always wanted to race, you know, unbound and, um, gravel has kind of been a fun new challenge for me. Like it's kind of a cool mix of you know, marathon mountain bike racing. And, you know, there's still some tactics from the road that I appreciate. So it's kind of been a bit of a learning curve for me, like learning, um, you know, some of these tactics and the you know, bunch dynamics, but there's also like some gravel races are more or less a marathon mountain bike race and you can just race it flat out. So it's kind of fun to have a bit of both. And I appreciate both styles of racing and I feel like gravel kind of blends the two. And it's also, um, you know, there's, there's so many, I mean, it's not, it's kind of its own, it's cool. It's its own discipline, you know, like you have to have some skills, you have to be a good, smart bike racer and you have to also be just super fit. So, um, you know, between doing that and, you know, I did like the 24 hours of Pueblo solo, that was some, something I'd always like want to do. You know, I've seen those guys like Tinker and all these guys doing the solo since I was, I'd race 24 hour races when I was a kid, as a team and like, that's something I was like want to do, but never, once again, never really found the opportunity to do it. And also thought it might like really wreck me for a long time. And then I felt like, you know, in 20, when I do that last year, yeah, 22, like I felt like I was, you know, finally ready to do it. And I was like, yeah, there's enough time between races. Like, like, fuck it. Let's just send it and see how it goes, you know? Uh, and had a lot of fun doing that. And I kind of piqued my interest for doing other, uh, like, I guess that's like almost into the, I guess that is ultra, you know, 24 hours is kind of like dipping your toe into the ultra thing. So then you wonder like, Oh, I can do 24 hours. Maybe I could do like 36 or, um, I don't know, you start wondering like what else you can push yourself to do, which is the cool thing about this sport is there's so many, so many ways you can go and, you know, things you can do. So, um, yeah, I don't know what's next for me in terms of like ultra stuff, but definitely thinking about all sorts of ideas, you know, what have you looked at in that regard? Um, I mean, the AZT 300, like the shorter version, um, has me pretty curious. Like, I don't know, like right now I'm not like super keen on doing anything that's like mega long because i still i want to go fast like that's why i like the 24 hour it's like you can still push quite hard and i think you could push just as hard for like 36 hours you back it off a little bit or you know 30 hours wherever the record is it's somewhere around there but i think you could still push pretty good there um and you know like the coca Pelly trail sounds cool like lachlan and pete have both gone done that and like jeffka bush and that's like i don't know it's like say like 10 hours 12 i don't know exactly what the record is but it's quite long you know so i think to me, that's like kind of a cool duration because you can still ride quite fast and, you know, you can cover some good ground, but you're not like, you're not out there jogging away for seven days. But who knows? Maybe I'll, you know, get more of an inch to, itch to go do like Colorado Trail or something like that. Because it does kind of intrigue me, but I also know like the sleep deprivation thing kind of, kind of scares me. So when you weren't selected for the Olympic team in 21, how did that feel? Were you disappointed? Were you excited about it, having the opportunity to do something new? Yeah, it was a bit of both. You know, I was definitely bummed, but at the same time, I was like, well, might as well like take advantage of this and go do, go do some other stuff. And felt like I kind of like found my stride in a way. Like I was always, you know, I was decent at XCO, but I felt like I was always better at like the longer, kind of harder events. Um, just have like a better, bigger aerobic motor, and it seemed like it suited me better, and definitely had more fun doing it. So in a way, it was like in the end kind of worked out for the best, you know? Why do you think you've been so well suited to these longer events? I mean, setting aside the fact that your engine and your physiology might be really well suited to it. It's also clearly like there's a huge mental component as these races get longer and harder. Some people really thrive in those conditions. Other people fall apart when there are things that happen on the course that, you know, they don't anticipate or don't find to be favorable, like the mud and mm -hmm. unbound, for example. Right. So how do you approach those things? Yeah. I mean, honestly, sometimes I find like the key to success in these gravel races is just like not giving up and just being tough. Like 
there's a lot of guys out there who are really strong, but in the end, like sometimes one little thing goes wrong. It just can derail their entire race. Um, so I think you have to go into the mindset of just not giving up and event like someone, everyone's going to have like one or two or more bad things happen to them, you know, whether it's bad luck or whatever it may be. Um, but if you just keep chugging along and keep fighting, eventually you'll keep fighting the front of the group, the front of the race, I think. So, um, that's why I like these long races that feel, I feel like there's in a way they're less stressful to me. Cause you, like if you have a flat tire or puncture or crash, whatever, like you still have, you know, unbound, you have hours and hours to make it up. So the race isn't, it's not over till it's over. So I think that's why I appreciate these longer events is you can just like, you might not always be the strongest one, but if you're the toughest one, you can still win. And heading into unbound this year, clearly there was the mud section. There's a lot of debate about whether that should have been included or not. I just had Ian Boswell on who talked about his experience at unbound and what was going on inside the league group. So we might as well talk mm -hmm. about it because you won the race. So, uh, you know, knowing that that section was going to be there that day, did that change anything for you psychologically in terms of how you felt going into the race or your strategy or tactics? Yeah. I mean, I was pretty fired up for it. You know, like I knew it was going to be a pretty nasty section. Um, like I'd pre-ridden it and knew that like once it rained, it was just going to turn to like that thick, nasty mud and it rained quite hard the day before and the night before the race. And I'd heard rumors they might have, they like, they might change the route or change the course. Um, but they never confirmed it. So I was like, well, I guess we're, we're going through the mud. Um, and I was all for it, you know, <laughs> uh, like that kind of suits me quite well. I just, cause I know how to, I know how to push through the mud and, um, also know, like I'm good at taking care of equipment and knowing like how that all works. So I think in those situations, just once again, it goes back to just not giving up, like everyone's dealing with the same shit. So it's really just, you have to just soldier through it and deal with it. <laughs> and, uh, it was nice to have a nice, you know, quick select group, like 10 miles into unbound, like, all right, here's the, here's the lead bunch. And I figured like Ian and those guys, like, I knew they wouldn't be far behind. Cause I know like Ian knows how to deal with that stuff. You know, even though he came from the road, he's done unbound enough times now that he knows how to handle the mud. And even though he might not be able to ride through it quite as fast as some of us who race mountain bikes, um, he still knows how to like, you know, take care of his bike and get through it quick. And along with, you know, him and Lachlan and, uh, 10 dam and those guys, I knew they'd be back. So I mean, once again, it goes back to just like, uh, just fighting through it and knowing they'd make it back to the front if they just pushed. So, um, yeah, I mean, I know there's a lot of debate about the mud, but I was, I was all for it. I think it just came down. Like, I think the whole thing is like with the amateurs, right? Like they sent us through the mud because they wanted the, they wanted the show and it's going to make, I'm sure they got some cool, cool footage and you know, it makes for exciting racing. Um, but maybe they shouldn't have sent the amateurs through. I don't know. And that's where like it gets a bit tricky with the gravel racing. Sometimes they're trying to balance like what they want the amateurs to do, what they want us to do. And I don't know. I think having like, they talked about having a reroute, which I think was a problem. Had they just said like, we're going through this, whether you guys like it or not from the beginning and made sure everyone was aware of it, that would have been totally cool. But I think like having like rumors of a reroute, like, where that was part of the problem. So I think they just, they just communication in the end, but, um, yeah, I was, I was stoked that we went through the mud. <laughs> yeah. And once you got through the mud, there was still a lot of time left in the race. I talked to Boswell about this. What was going on in your mind between there and like getting to the campus where stuff really started to kick off and people started to kind of jockey for position Lachlan attacked. You're trying to get ready for the finale. How did you mentally manage the rest of the race? Yeah. I mean, I knew like, you know, coming out of that mud, like I knew we still are going to have, you know, eight and a half, nine hours left in, of the race or more, I guess. Um, so it's like at that point, you just kept to stay on the gas and make those guys chase. Right. Like, I don't know. We didn't know who was behind. I knew there was no one else ahead because there was a group of, I don't know, maybe it was six of us or whatever that were rolling turns and everyone knew like everyone's on the same page. Like, let's just make this the group, you know, and if anyone else catches us, then they're going to have to work harder than us to bring, bring back that time. Um, so then, yeah, once Lauren's, uh, Pete, uh, Lachlan, Tendam and Bakash and Voss caught up, uh, the group kind of slowly whittled down. There's a few guys in the front that made it through the mud that weren't 
quite strong enough to hang on to the the group once we really got rolling and then it kind of you know there's some flats and all sorts of chaos as usual um but everyone seemed to have the same mindset of let's just make this race hard and you know make sure no one comes back and because there were still some guys back there that were a threat you know like matt beers wasn't there we're like eventually probably gonna see him again we never did because he ended up having a bunch of flat tires and some other stuff um you know but there was like some other guys chasing as well. They were like, we didn't just don't want to deal with that. So we just, you know, everyone was down to rotate and keep it hard. And, and then, uh, you know, every climb was like Lachlan or P if someone was going to attack and make it hard. Um, but no one was really, uh, everyone was seemed like everyone was going quite good. And, you know, I kind of had a feeling it was going to come down to a, a sprint or like a last, you know, few mile attack. So yeah, that's, that's the way it was. It was a cool bike race. You know, that was like definitely one all, I always remember just the way that everyone was down to just roll and there was really no bullshit out there, which was cool. And when you got to the finish shoot, had you anticipated and thought through this is going to be totally clogged with amateurs finishing their races? Had that even entered your sphere of consciousness? Yeah, I mean, I knew from last year that it was probably going to be the same uh, same situation and that definitely, like, you have to be ready for it. And, like, you know, I knew I wasn't sure you, you don't know if they're going to be there or not. Like there's a chance that it's going to be a clean finish shoot. There's also a very good chance there's going to be people in there. And there was quite a few of amateurs finishing their hundred mile race. So, um, you had to kind of play the cards, right. Make sure you get around them and make sure you not to take anyone out. And, uh, yeah, it was a bit, it's a bit hectic and hopefully, uh, hopefully they sort that out for next year and that it doesn't happen again. Cause I think it's, really only a matter of time before like someone gets hurt. Cause all, I mean, those guys are out on their phones recording us sprinting. And if they had like swerved and like bumped into us or like, I don't know. And it also just would make it a little bit more fair. If everyone had a nice long straight dragon in the finish, then you're not like racing. They're not, they're not being part of the race, you know? So, um, but yeah, I was definitely ready for it. and knew it could be an issue. When you think back about the goals you set at the beginning of the season and the program that you had, which included, Cape Epic, like with Cape Epic specifically, when you put that on your calendar and had it in your program, were you concerned that it might have negative impacts on events later in the year? Or did you feel like, Hey, there's enough distance? Cause that's, I mean, that's a ton, like a very large scale piece of international travel. People pretty frequently get very sick at Cape mm-hmm. Epic and it's a brutal race. Right. So how did you think about that and how it fit into your overall schedule? Yeah. I mean, I know like, you know, a big block like that normally does me quite well as long as I can get some time to rest afterward. Um, so, you know, like the key is, I mean, doing that. And then I really wanted to come back and like, I would have liked to race, you know, Belgian waffle ride, California, but I was like, yeah, just a little bit close to Cape Epic. And it's better to, you know, air on the, the cautious side and make sure to make sure I'm fully recovered before like starting to push again. So, um, you know, I know I can recover quite well from those efforts as long as they're managed well. And um, for me, the other, you just got to go into them fit enough too. So I like to go, you know, you go into it prepared and then you come out of it and you can rest. And then you're going, for me, I'm always like going really well. So, I mean, Sea Otter was good and you know, I felt good the following weekend at Whiskey 50. But I think had I tried to race a weekend before, it might've been a little bit too much. So just kind of like listening to your body and knowing like when you're good to start pushing again and um, if you should pull back and rest a bit more. But yeah, I mean, it can be a bit of a gamble for some, but I know like, how I respond to those efforts and know that I can come out of them really fit as long as I respect it. What did you get out of that experience just as a human being going over there doing that specific race, which is quite different than certainly anything we have in the United States? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's hard racing. You know, I learned that the year I did it last year as well. And, uh, you know, going into that race, it's, it's pretty gnarly, you know, for us every day starts like a cross country race. It's wide open and, pretty much just go as hard as you can for the first hour or so. And then it kind of settles in and more like kind of marathon racing. But, um, you know, there's 150 guys like going <laughs> full gas. So it's, it's pretty hectic racing. Uh, it's a lot of fun though. It's kind of like in a way what I wish we had more of over here. Uh, it's kind of like a mix. There's like some two track, a lot of single track. It's just hard, um, all day, every day. And it's, um, kind of unique. I think racing with a partner too is a bit of a different dynamic than you're used to because you're trying to, I mean, take care of each other and, um, but at the same time race everywhere, race everyone else. So, um, yeah, it's cool. Going, you know, again, going back to 2022, you also were at road worlds. How did that experience come about and why was that something that you wanted to do? Yeah. I mean, that kind of 
came about with you know there's a lot of the like the world tour teams were under rele- like under threat of getting relegated um just didn't have enough points so like a lot of the ef riders and track and movistar and whatnot they all had to you know go chase points and uh so there weren't like the world tour guys weren't there weren't as, as many as normal that were able to race it so there was some open spots and you know i think uh yeah, it was like a coach's nomination through USA Cycling. And I was like, yeah, sure, I'll go give it a crack. It sounded like, I mean, it's always something I would would want to want to do. Um, definitely a crazy experience. You know, it was like nothing I'd really ever done. I may have raced road over here before and, you know, I've just done gravel racing and whatnot. Never, haven't done any road races that big. So it was definitely like just thrown straight in the deep end. And I think it was, in the end, it was good. You know, I think I learned a lot and can take, take it what I learned there and apply it to gravel. Um, and mountain bike racing, like it's definitely it all, you can, they all kind of blend together at a certain point and you can learn from each of them. So it was a cool experience. What, what did you feel like you learned specifically, whether it was from like travel preparation, what actually went down inside of the race, what was different or new for you? I think it was mostly like the, the bunch dynamics, like being in a Peloton that big and everyone, you know, had a move through the group efficiently without using too much energy. Cause that was quite difficult for me. And I kind of feel like I kind of got a hung of it, hang of it as the race went on. But, um, yeah, it was, it was a lot of, like, it feels like you're constantly trying to swim upstream, you know, because everyone wants to be in the same spot or wants to be in the front. So you have to find the efficient way to get there without like just doing a ton of power on the outside and the wind. It's like just trying to slowly work your way up and, um, and then trying to stay there, you know? So sometimes you find yourself at the front the next thing, you know, you run a few turns and you're spat right out the back and have to do it again so uh yeah i think it's like after doing that then you come come i was come come back over here and race gravel and you're like oh it's easy to stay in the bunch now it's no problem because at first it was a little bit intimidating you know racing in these like because mountain bike racing like you have the start and it's packed and hectic but that's only a couple minutes long and then you're then you're into the trail and it kind of calms down a little bit whereas that it's you know it's six hours of kind of hectic sketchiness so um yeah just a lot kind of different style and when you went and did road worlds there was a lot of speculation based on how you did in gravel last year and your power profile people looking at how you performed in these really long hard races that you might go to the world tour was that something that you thought about yeah i mean it was something you know we talked about it and like looked into a few options but nothing really um was going to be exactly what I wanted to do. Cause I really did. I didn't want to like fully give up racing off road, you know? Um, so yeah, it would have been cool if we could, you know, blend a program together, but I'm also happy like where I ended up. Like I love doing what I'm doing and when, you know, wouldn't change it for anything. So, uh, I think I, in the end made the right decision to, to stay racing off road. There's still a lot, a lot more to be done. If you had a magic wand and you could put together some fantasy scenario where you could do road, and everything else that you love doing, what would that program look like? I mean, it'd be really cool to race, you know, some of those classics, the spring classics, uh, Strata Bianchi and Roubaix and whatnot. I think that some of those races would suit me quite well. It seems like they're not too far off of like some of the really hard gravel races. Obviously it's different. Um, but in the end, I think it's kind of a similar style of racing in the, ten- in the sense that it's like really hard when you're on the cobbles and there's some steep, hard climbs and it's just long and kind of arduous. So I think those races, it's races would suit me quite well. Um, but so yeah, I don't know, maybe someday I'll get to do them, but you know, <laughs> is it something that you're still considering doing? Are there active conversations to explore that for 2024 or have you just kind of shut the door on it for now? Right now we're just fully focused on, on the off-road scene, uh, over here. And also like maybe go do some of the UCI gravel world series and, uh, gravel UCI gravel world championships and whatnot. Um, and then there's also, you know, some marathon, mar- mount- marathon mountain bike races I'd like to do, um, like marathon worlds and some other events like that. So yeah, we're just fully focused on that right now. What do you enjoy about this program that you've put together? Obviously, I don't know you very well at all, but you strike me as somebody who's really happy doing what you do, which is not the case for everybody and jobs generally. And even within professional cycling, there are a lot of people who are like, whatever, I'm just punching a clock. I happen to be good at this thing. I get the sense that you actually love what you do and it mm-hmm. brings you a lot of joy. Is that true? Yeah. I mean, I, I love what I do, you know, and I think I'm definitely stoked to be in a situation where like with the Santa Cruz hit squad team, like they definitely give me 
a lot of freedom to do what I want. You know, we kind of build a schedule early this season. Like, all right, what, what do you want to do this year? You know, so we have like a lifetime series, a couple of Belgian waffle rides, and then we have, you know, some mountain bike races, Cape Epic. And it's more or less just do the schedule that I want to do. And, you know, I think for us that like, in the end, that helps bring success too. Cause if I'm, I'm doing stuff that I want to do, then I'm going to be better at it than if you're forcing me to race all, race all these random races and race too much. Um, I think for me, I like to focus on, you know, a few key races a year rather than, you know, spread myself too thin. So I've kind of learned that like, I'm better just to cherry pick a few races and, um, go all in on those rather than race every weekend and just kind of crack on it. Cause I do love, I love racing and I love training, but I, I, uh, you know, I think for me, I can only race so much and only push myself that deep so often. So I think I have to kind of manage that. Otherwise I can get a little, I don't know, I just kind of can cook myself like a little too excited and start racing too much. And then end up, you end up just like kind of frying yourself mentally and physically. What event would you consider to be your favorite event of all the events that you compete in? Uh, and I think, man, hard to say. I think Unbound is definitely the top of that list. I think, cause it's so, it's such a unique race in the sense that it's like 10 hours long. Um, you can have all sorts of crazy conditions, like equipment plays a massive role. So, you know, you, I've tested all sorts of different tire combinations and, uh, just different gear gearing and bike setup. And then you have to deal with all your spares and nutrition and your aid slash pit stations. Like, I think there's so much that goes into it. And I really think that's like kind of a, that's one of my favorite parts of racing is like figuring out like what else you can do to win the race other than just ride your bike hard uh so yeah it's kind of become one of my favorite races you know i spend like months down in tucson in the winter just kind of dialing in everything and riding a bunch of gravel and playing with equipment and tire pressure and different inserts and there's so many there's so many variables that i i think it's cool and then you go into the race and you have to like kind of execute everything to the best of your ability and um yeah i don't know that's just a cool one from having Tobin on the show, he talked to me a bit about your methodologies around trying to make sure you have your equipment, not just totally dialed in, but that you have everything optimized. You're getting the very most out of it, that you have the very best equipment. Could you talk a little bit about that approach? And in practice, like when you're down in Tucson and whatever it is, you're trying to figure out this is going to be the best tire for these conditions or you know, I'm going to do this amount of sealant, whatever it is. How do you conduct those experiments? And like, what are you tinkering with now? If there's anything that you can share? I mean, honestly, down in Tucson, like the gravel is so rugged and so gnarly that I just go out and like, more or less, like try and break things, you know, uh, like, see, so yeah, I'd make sure the wheels hold up, make sure the tires hold up. Um, like I run like aluminum handlebars and all that stuff on my bike, just to make sure everything's the most as durable as it can be because if you crash and like snap a drop or if your bars slip because you can only torque them to five newton meters like there's all these like small things that i've like figured out that just work for me so i think i like to ride the bike i push it quite hard you know i ride it like it's a mountain bike so i think i have to find the equipment that works and you know santa cruz makes some of the most i'd say one of the most, some of the most durable bikes and then like reserve wheels as well like i go out and i'm, I'm racing on road, road wheels you know and we just slam those things around and um yeah. Then like play with various different tires, you know, I've experimented with the Rambler and like silk shield. And then you have my trusty refuse, which I ran last year, but this year it was like with the mud and whatnot, I didn't want to gamble. So I went, went back to the Rambler. Um, you know, but I spent time on both just like making sure I know both, you know, what pressures to run and, um, yeah, you know, I set the bike up one bike. So I think that's in the most efficient way for especially for unbound you eliminate a front trailer you eliminate like one less thing to break you know um so that's nice you know run, we run the sram like the mullet set up with the the road front and the the uh eagle in the back so you have a wide range and um yeah i think it's just the most durable setup so nothing that i'm like really messing with right now like i found my bike was pretty much dialed for unbound um but yeah now it's you know we're changing things around for crusher and these other races but I don't really vary too much from the literally just swap out tires and only able to change wheels based on the course and the, the profile, but, um, otherwise probably run the same gearing and, you know, same handlebar stem and all that stuff. When you look at the landscape of events right now, there are certain events that you, they're kind of mandatory for you to do because there's everything that's in the lifetime series, of course. Then, as you mentioned, 
There's the BWR stuff. You've done Cape Epic a couple of times. Is there anything domestically that you'd like to try that you just haven't had time to go do on the event side of things? Like, are there any gravel events that you've heard about that have caught your eye? Um, I don't know. Nothing like that I haven't done, I guess, yet. Uh, I would like to go back and give BWR San Diego another crack. So my first attempt there, I kind of I mean, I had a big crash and you know kind of blew it up and it wasn't a great day. So I want to go back. I want to go back and give that one another go. That one's kind of like the original gravel race, I guess. And it's cool because you kind of I mean you're racing smaller tires than normal and it's kind of a unique race. Um, and I also used to spend a lot of time training down there in, in that area in the winters. So for me, it's like, you know, kind of another, I don't know consider like I've ridden all those, all those roads and I um, spent a lot of time down there. So it's, I'd like to go give it in their crack. Otherwise, I don't know. I mean, there's a lot of cool events, you know, hard to say exactly what other ones. Um, but yeah, but I like to try more of the Belgian waffle rides. So a lot of those are really fun. I, mean, I haven't done one that I disliked, you know, the one in Arizona was a lot of fun and, um, just hard to, to fit them in, you know? Yeah, definitely. When you think about events, are there any characteristics of events that you think like, these are the things that make for a really great event that you'd like to see more of in events generally. Um, in terms of gravel racing, I love the ones that have like just a very wide variety of terrain. Like it's really cool to have, you know, some kind of technical single track, but then also like a lot of really fast pavement and sections that are draftable. So it's like, you have to be, um, you know, a good bike handler and it's like, a, then you can kind of gamble on tires a little more if you want to run small ones or big ones. Like I like those events that like, there's no perfect bike and there's no perfect setup. You kind of have to pick what you're going to set your bike up for and kind of go all in on it. Um, so yeah, I think that's, I don't know. I wish there was more like the BWR seems to do a pretty good job of that. Like Arizona had some single track. It had some fast stuff. Um, so yeah, it seems like, you know, like unbound is all kind of the same kind of terrain. So it's, I don't know, it'd be cool to have more races, like other races that had more varying terrain. Um, yeah, I don't know. That's, kind of a tough question. I do like the ones too, that I have, um, that are like somewhat, like I appreciate that like unbound only has two feed zones, you know, makes it like simple, um, kind of self-supported. I don't, man, I know like gravel locos has like the mandatory two minute stop thing, which I think is stupid. I don't think you should, they should tell you how to race your bike. So that's why I haven't done one of those. <laughs> uh, so maybe they'll change that. Like if you want to stop for water, stop. If you don't, don't like, I don't know why the, you know, why they're trying to force you how to race. Uh, but yeah, I don't know. Um, there's a lot, of, a lot of cool events out there. Definitely a lot of heat right now about pit stops. In fact, today I got like four different people forwarded me different Instagram posts where people are mad or have different points of view about the pit stops at Unbound. Yeah. What's like, what's your point of view? I mean, I think it's cool to have it be part of the race. You know, like that's, we were in and out of there and I feel like I was there for maybe 10 seconds. And then the second one, I didn't stop. I just picked bottles up and went um and you know that's like kind of a gamble that those in the front take like if you if you stop for longer sure you can get make sure you have everything and whatnot but if you don't stop then that's a free few seconds and it seemed like everyone in the front was on board to hit it fast um and keep it rolling because that's like free time on the groups behind you know so i think it's like it's also like part of the just how part of the race and it's fun to like talk to your mechanic and make figure out all the strategy make sure you have everything you need strapped to the bottle or whether it's in your pack or whatever you're doing um i think like having a quick quick pits is you know it's kind of fun you know it's like that's what they do in car racing it's no different in bike racing just be the same thing just as efficiently possible there's no reason you should be like dilly dallying for a minute and a half in there or whatever you know um so yeah i think it's I think it's cool kind of fair game to do whatever then you have races like steamboat that have all these neutral feed zones and like some of us stop some don't and i don't know it's cool to have you know different strategies has alejandro valverde reached out to you to get some gravel tips <laughs> no he is not not no. yet he's got to figure those out on his own I yeah i don't know i thought for sure he was going to show up at unbound yeah i, I heard like rumors he was but i didn't see him there yeah, not yet. I feel like it's the day is coming though when he shows up at one of these events. It just feels like it's inevitable to right. me. Um, but I mean, like you mentioned Tinker earlier, of course, one of the heroes of that like early to mid nineties Norba scene. Mm -hmm. And like before him, it was guys like Tomac. And with that early Norba stuff, you know, the US pretty much invented 
professional mountain bike racing. Then over time, we saw Euros coming over and then all the action moved to Europe. There's now the UCI gravel series, which there's no way it's going to replace kind of the heritage of these events in the US. But where do you see the sport going as there's greater and greater interest, not just from the industry, but from people who are current active world tour pros, actually? I mean, I, I think it's cool. You know, I think it having more more competition and, you know, like having more in the sport just makes it makes it better and more fun for everyone. Um, and it makes the racing more interesting to watch. Like, you know, Unbound, you know, like five years ago, it definitely wasn't nearly the same as it is now. You know, it's like now there's a seven seven up sprint, you know, which is just shows how competitive the fields are over here. And, you know, every year it seems that like there's more and more European racers and, you know, there's some, you know, we have Matt Beers from South Africa and you have some Aussies coming and racing. And I think these races are just getting more and more competitive and it's cool to have, you know, a mix of mountain bikers, like gravel specialists. And then you have, you know, the world tour guys coming in and, and racing as well. And it's, everyone has their own set of skills and abilities and it's uh, kind of cool to see them all come together and kind of see who comes out on top after 10 hours of racing and unbound or whatever it may be. Um, so yeah, I'm curious, like what'll happen with the gravel world series right now. It seems like it's slowly growing. Uh, I'm not sure if it'll like really take off or not. Um, and like, if they'll start, you know, having more bigger races over here that all of us will go to. Cause right now there's only a couple and really no one attends them. Cause they're just kind of at weird times and sponsors don't care about them as nearly as much as like unbound or, you know, steamboat or Belgium waffle ride or whatever. So, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know. It's hard to say. Either way, I think, I mean, gravel's growing and it'd be cool to see it, you know, keep progressing. I mean, at the pro level, it almost feels to me a bit like early UFC and pride. I, do, I don't know if you follow mixed martial arts at all, but I mean, in the early days, it was this contest of which style is going to win when you put them together right. to compete. And I mean, we're, we're seeing that right now, right? It's like people from all these different disciplines dropping into these races and that's pretty exciting. Yeah, I think it's cool. And it's a lot of fun to fun to race, you know, because everyone has their own tactics of how they can win and everyone, you know, people are better at certain things. So I think it's, uh, it makes for exciting racing. And then it makes, you know, like, like oh, I need to work on this or I need to get stronger here and uh, figure this out. So it's kind of, I think it's made me a lot better bike racer, racing racing gravel. It's, made, it's improved my mountain biking and, and everything. So, uh, yeah, it's cool. How has your life changed in the last, you know, 12 to 18 months? You've had so much success. It seems like when you show up, your competitors seem to have, they seem to actually fear you is kind of the vibe I get uh, from watching social media, the Lifetime YouTube series, and then listening to other podcasts with other gravel pros or even having them on my podcast. You've been such a dominant force. So how have things changed for you, if at all? I mean, I mean, in terms of my like day to day, nothing's really changed. You know, I'm just going about my life, doing my thing. I think that's what works for me. Like I just, you know, train hard and I mean, show up to win every race I do, and uh, whether I win or lose, I'm you know give it everything. And I think for me, I just focus on myself. I don't really worry about like me. You know, most of the time, I don't even look at a start list of who's racing. Like it doesn't matter. I just show up and do my thing and. Um, I think try and keep my head like in a good spot, you know, just worry about myself and um, yeah, I don't know, hard to say, but honestly, nothing's really uh, changed a whole lot, you know, doing a few more podcasts and stuff like that in terms of like social media uh, obligations, but nothing is, uh, I've, nothing's changed in my world. So uh, yeah, try and keep it that way. Just try and keep things mellow and train hard, you know, keep my head down, keep grinding. <laughs> what kind of loser are you? Uh, I mean, I guess I'm a good, I'm a good one in some ways, but I'm more just upset at myself, you know, uh, like I was pretty bummed, you know, second place at Unbound last year and basically just put a target on this race. And I was like, you know, it was all in to win, um, and was, you know, just focused, you know, made sure it didn't happen, made sure what second didn't happen again. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I'm always, you know, like if someone's better than me and they beat me, then that's, that's great. Like you know, that I try to figure out why and what I did wrong and why I didn't win. Um, but you know, there's always, whether they were stronger, whether they were smarter, I just try and figure that out and figure out like what, what went wrong. You know, and I wouldn't say like, 
mean, I'm not a sore loser because I'm always stoked for whoever whoever it is that wins. But it, I'm still bummed at myself. Like I feel like, for me, like I, I don't know. I just I don't I don't like losing. I race to win, and I mean that's that's the way it is. When you lost Unbound last year, what were your takeaways that you focused on to make sure you'd be able to win the race this year? Um, honestly, it's mostly tactics. You know, like last year, uh, like the group was big for quite a while, and I just did more work than a lot of guys. And I think in the end, like I learned, just need to pay more attention to who's working and who's not, and kind of read the race a little better. Because sometimes in these races, you, it works to just ride hard. You know, you can just go to the front and hammer, and you just shell guys. But uh, in a race like Unbound, with so much drafting and so long, that you can't you can't just ride that hard that long and let people sit in. Um, and then also like, you know, the finish, the last few miles, like just dialing in that and knowing how to respond to attacks and, um, you know, how to, you know, how to finish a sprint. Cause I think for me, like I, I'm pretty good at winning in like a two or three up sit scenario, uh, in a sprint finish, but I, I had no idea how to, how to, how to deal with a sprint with, I think there was five or six of us and last year and I was like, man, I. I, I went into that with zero confidence. You know, that last few miles, I was like, I don't know what to do. Like, I'm just going <laughs> to try and follow wheels here. And they, they just kind of worked me over, you know? So I think I, I learned my lesson and, you know, tried to figure out a better, better way. And, you know, it's nice. Like Tobin's a really good bike racer. He's done a lot of, I mean, he's a really good cross racer and he's quite good at crits and whatnot. So having him on the team has been helpful for me. I think, uh, like having him unbound, we know we rode the last few miles and ran over all sorts of different, different scenarios of like, if he, who would, if someone attacks here, then I can go if, you know, just, and where to launch the sprint. Um, so I think, yeah, that's been beneficial and I'm just always open. My coach is also helpful with tactics and you know, how to, how to win races from different ways. Cause coming from the mountain bike, it's like, you know, if you're just, you just have to be strong and just play your cards right in terms of fitness and not blow yourself up. But in these gravel races, you also also have to worry about other people and what they're doing and not worry about, it's not exclusively about fitness. So you have to, you know, make sure everyone's working equally. And if they're not working equally, then force them to and find a way to make that happen. Um, so yeah, I guess those were kind of my takeaways from last year. And so Unbound was like a huge focus for your season this year. When you look at the rest of the season, I'm sure winning the Lifetime Grand Prix is an objective. Is there anything else that is a super high priority for you that you'd be really thrilled that's kind of a, a lifetime goal so to speak that you want to make happen this season um i mean unbound was a big one this year you know last year i mean i really wanted to win uh lead leadville and steamboat back to back that was like i mean also unbound was a goal last year too but i i blew that one so then you know all focus was on leadville and steamboat and this year um i checked unbound off the list which was a really big relief you know because i had a huge target on that one so definitely nice to get that monkey off my back going the rest of the season. It just feels like I've had a, in a way, like there wasn't much pressure from sponsors or anything. It was just my own, my own desires. Um, yeah, I mean, this year I'd, I, mean, I want to get the, the record at Leadville. That would be pretty sweet, but it's a bit of a balance of like trying to win the race while also trying to get the record. So, I mean, obviously there's conditions play a huge part and whatever else, but that's a, yeah, that's a big goal this year. So. Is there anything that you're doing different in your preparation for Leadville this year to get the record or is it just taking the same approach and seeing what happens on race day? Yeah, I mean, yeah, kind of in terms of training, I think more or less the same. I mean, I haven't talked to the coach a whole lot about what the plan is, but I, my, my guess is we're just trying to do the same lead in because the fitness was good. It's more or less just at that altitude. It's just kind of learning uh, if you can push a bit harder, you know, find, kind of push the limit a little more. And I think I have a little more to give. Um, so it's just a matter of like kind of squeezing it a little bit more um, and then dialing in equipment. Like, I don't know if I'm going to race the same setup or if I'll change things, um, but need to play with that a bit too. So, And with the program that you have right now, whether it's like logistics, travel, a specific race, what do you find to be the most difficult about the program that you have now managing it and the competitions? Um, honestly, it's, I mean, I think it's pretty smooth. You know, we got a pretty, we've got a pretty dialed program, you know, my mechanic Myron is a huge help in keeping all the equipment dialed. Cause I think kind of the biggest, the biggest task for the, like the lifetime series is like trying to balance, you have so much stuff, you know, you have gravel bikes and mountain bikes and 
you know, some, some trips you have to bring both. And it's just a matter of like managing all that. And then, um, it's a bit tricky in terms of like keeping race fitness there because there's like a race, seems like there's a race like every month. Um, you know, some races you have, you're not expecting to be like fully at your best. Uh, and then you kind of have to just like, you know, and th there's other guys you might be like targeting that race. So you kind of have to manage that a bit. Um, and then, you know, just aim for the ones that you really want to perform at. But, uh, yeah. So I think those are the biggest challenges, but you know, you've got a good program going. When you look at the careers of other pros, are there any careers that you really look up to or that you'd like to emulate or are you just happy doing your own thing? Uh, I don't know, kind of just happy doing my own thing, you know, like I've really looked up to guys like Todd Wells. And that was for me that he was like one of the big reasons I started racing mountain bikes. You know, like I used to watch those guys race at uh, Deer Valley Norbert race here when I was a kid and I was doing the little like grass crit race they had for the kids and saw them racing mountain bikes, um, you know, but I've kind of in a way found what I want to do and I don't really like I'm not really emulating anything that anyone's done. Like I feel like I've kind of carved my own path more or less, you know, racing gravel and mountain bikes and 24 hour solos and Cape Epic and, you know, jumping into road worlds and stuff. Like, I think that's can be a bit of a mistake sometimes to like follow someone else's path too closely in a way you kind of have to carve your own and do your own thing and do what keeps you stoked. Otherwise you're not going to make it as long in the sport as you think. So I think those guys who had great success did what they wanted to do and what they were good at. So if you try and just do exactly what they did, it's not necessarily going to work for you. Yeah. Well, Keegan, it certainly seems to be working. I'm grateful that you took time to connect today to have this chat. So thanks for joining me, man.